One of the most disappointing endings in human history took place on September 4th, 476. An empire that at one time stretched from the outskirts of northern Britain all the way to the desert frontiers of Syria and North Africa has finally come to an end. It did so not with some grand crescendo, but rather with the most pitiful and whimpering of sounds. The sacking of the city by Alaric in the year 410 was the final nail in the coffin for the city, which had been ravaged by decades of conflict and political unrest. It was up to Odoacer, several decades later, to visit the city that had formerly served as the imperial capital and coerce the abdication of Romulus Augustulus, an emperor who was just 16 years old at the time. The fate of the deposed boy emperor is unknown, but when he was removed from power, the Roman Empire was no longer a viable political entity. At the very least, it had done so throughout the western portion of Europe. In the east, the empire continued to thrive. The new capital that Constantine chose to establish in 330 Constantinople had already served as the de facto seat of empire for well over a century by that point, with Rome maintaining only its ideological and historical significance. The pragmatic political and administrative goals of Diocletian from a century earlier were realized thanks to Theodosius I in 395, when the empire was effectively split in two. The concept of Rome continued to hold a magnetic pull for the emerging Byzantine Empire in the East. However, Renovatio Imperii, which literally translates to the restoration of the empire, remained little more than a pipe dream. It was up to Emperor Justinian, who ruled from 527 to 565, to bring the empire back together after it had been divided. Making an Emperor, Justinian and Justin. His unassuming beginnings serve as a good cover for the ambitious plans that Justinian has for his future. Around the year 482, he was born into a humble family of Illyro-Roman peasants in the ancient city of Taurasium, which is now known as the modern city of Gradite in northern Macedonia. However, he was a natural speaker of Latin, and it is thought that he was the final Roman emperor to be able to do so. After him, Greek would become the official language of the empire. In addition, he was born in Taurisium about the year 480, the same year that Theodahad, who would later become king of the Ostrogoths, was born there. Justinian's mother, Vigilantia, had a brother named Justin who was quite influential in the community. During the time that his nephew was being born, Justin was serving as the leader of a unit of excubiters. These were the imperial guards that had been established in 460 by Emperor Leo I. As was the case with the imperial guard units that they had previously been assigned to replace, the Scoli Palatini and the Praetorians in Rome, the excurbitors discovered that they were in an ideal position to play the role of kingmakers. However, prior to this, Justin was responsible for monitoring his nephew's academic progress. Justinian was brought to Constantinople for questioning. There, he obtained an education that comprised instruction in law, theology, and Roman history. These are three disciplines that would come to determine the path that his life would take in the years to come. During this period, Justin was working as a member of the Imperial Bodyguard Team. This indicated that he was in a favorable situation. After the death of Anastasius the Fund in the year 518, he was named Emperor, and it is said that his nephew provided him with a great deal of support. His reign was rather short in duration. Justinian served as a trusted advisor throughout, so much so that by the time his uncle's health began to deteriorate and he was nearing the end of his life, Justinian was de facto ruling the empire on his uncle's behalf. When one considers Justinian's lowly beginnings, his meteoric climb to power is all the more impressive. By the year 521, he had been promoted to the position of consul, and he would later be given command of the Eastern Army. Because of this, his elevation to the position of emperor on August 1st of that same year, 527, was not in the least bit unexpected. Ruling an Empire, Justinian, and Roman Law More than just a political and geographical entity, the Roman Empire was the focus of Justinian's efforts to revive it. A common perspective on the world served as the glue that held everything together. In spite of the fact that Greco-Roman civilization had advanced much in the decades following Constantine's conversion to Christianity, the empire was still held together by a common sense of who it was. 
The legal system was essential to this. Justinian's schooling included study in the law, and he began his reign as emperor by conducting an exhaustive and unprecedented review and rewriting of Roman law. The results of his effort are now referred to collectively as the Corpus Juris Civilis, which literally translates to body of civil law. This compilation of important legal writings was put together between the years 529 and 534, and it contains the Digest, the Institutiones, the Novellae, and the Codex Justinianus. Tribonian, who served as Justinian's quaestor, was in charge of overseeing the process of compiling the knowledge necessary to build this body of legal literature. The Codex Justinianus was the first of these writings to be finished after they were begun. From the beginning of the second century forward, this was used as the foundation for the formulation of imperial constitutions. The contained constitutions did not predate Hadrian's rule when he was in power. This work was ostensibly written with the intention of compiling one law system out of several earlier attempts, one of which was the Theodosian system. It was subsequently followed by the Digest, and then it was followed by the Institutiones, which outlined the fundamental legal concepts. These works served as the foundation for Latin jurisprudence, but the novellae were where the political reality of the separation between East and West became clear. This compilation of new legislation, which dates back to the reign of Justinian, was written in Greek, which was the language most commonly used across the Eastern Empire at the time. Since Justinian's legal reforms remain crucial to most of the legal practice in Europe even today, they had an impact that survived all of his other efforts to re-establish the empire. The fundamental ideas were preserved in Norman law, as well as in the legal code of the Catholic Church, known as canon law. An emperor challenged, Justinian and the Nica riot. Remarkable ruins can be found in many countries across Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East today. These ruins are evidence of the Roman Empire's significance and love of entertainment. From the theaters, where comedies and dramas were performed on stage, to the arenas, where men and animals fought and died to the sound of people booing and chanting, it was all there. The gladiatorial battles held in the amphitheaters had steadily waned in popularity over the course of the 4th century, and they were eventually outlawed. Despite this, chariot races in the hippodromes continued to enjoy the massive levels of popularity that they had for millennia. It is said that Emperor Caracalla, who was known for his irritability, was an avid follower of the sport. In the Hippodrome of Constantinople, Justinian's supporters, the Blues, faced off against Justinian's rivals, the Greens. There was a strong connection between the support for these teams and other social and political issues. The flames of rebellion were fanned in the year 532 by the unpopularity of Justinian and his counselors, particularly Tribonian, which was caused by high taxes as well as a number of other difficulties. The botched execution of several members of each team who had instigated violence several days before to the events that occurred was the impetus for the subsequent violent confrontations. The men ran away from the place where they were being executed and sought refuge in a nearby church. They went on to become a focal point of public unity in the face of tyranny by the imperial government at the races that followed. In the same way that the Palatine Palaces in Rome looked out over the Circus Maximus, the Hippodrome of Constantinople was located right next to the complex of imperial palaces in the city. On the other hand, it made it possible for members of the people to express their annoyance with the situation. This is something that they did, and they did it loudly and vociferously during the races on the 13th of January 532, in circumstances that are related by Procopius in the 1. 24th chapter of the History of the Wars, the usual chance of partisan support had transitioned into a unifying outcry for Nika, victory, which literally translates to win, the masses became violent and set fire to buildings while also attempting to storm the palace. The violence continued for about a week, during which time there was an increase in the number of people calling for the expulsion of Tribonian and even Justinian from his position as emperor. Justinian reportedly found strength in the bravery of his wife and was able to rally. He sent in dependable generals, such as Narses and Belisarius, among others. The supporters of the Blues received gold from Narses, 
After everyone had dispersed, Belisarius and his troops marched into the Hippodrome and murdered whoever was still there. One week later, it is said that over 30,000 protesters had been put to death, making this one of the bloodiest uprisings in the history of Rome. Despite this, the Emperor Justinian was able to solidify his place as the most powerful figure in the Mediterranean world as a result of the blood that was spilled. During the uprising, the city was completely destroyed, providing the emperor with a blank canvas on which the architectural and topographical representation of his power could soon be erected. An empire restored? Justinian's wars in the east and west. The Roman Empire had always been plagued by war, and the reign of Justinian was no exception to this pattern. When he took the throne, he inherited from his predecessor Justin an unfinished campaign in the east known as the so-called Iberian War, although it was actually fought against the Kingdom of Iberia in Georgia and not the Iberian Peninsula. The conflict, which started in the year 526 and lasted until 527, pitted the Eastern Roman Empire against the Sasanian Empire. It was a battle that was fueled by disputes over trade and tribute. The Romans were victorious at the Battle of Thanuris in 528, but they were soundly destroyed at the Battle of Callinicum in 531. The Roman War was a failure overall. After Kavad, king of the Sassanid Empire, passed away, Justinian was able to pursue a diplomatic solution with Khosro I, Kavad's son. The pact that was struck, which came to be known as the Perpetual Peace, demanded the return by both parties of all conquered territory, as well as a one-time payment of 11,000 pounds of gold from the Roman side. However, the term was a bit of a misnomer for what it was. In following years, Justinian's military operations in the West would leave these provinces unattended, providing Khosrow with an opportunity that was simply too good to pass up. The military operations that Emperor Justinian conducted in the West took place in stages. During the initial stage of the struggle, an attempt was made to retake lands in North Africa that had been lost since they were conquered by the Vandals in the 5th century. The deposition of King Hilderic by Gelimer in the year 530 provided Justinian with a justification for intervening in the conflict. The emperor dispatched Belisarius to the continent of Africa. There, he prevailed over the Vandals in a number of engagements, the most significant of which took place in December 533 at Trichomerum. In the year 534, Gelimer was carried as a prisoner of war to Constantinople and marched through the city as part of the imperial procession. Similar to how he did it in North Africa, Justinian exploited dynastic problems in the Italian Ostrogothic kingdom as a casus belli for the attempted reconquest. More specifically, he used the usurpation of Theodahad in 534 as the impetus for the conflict. In the year 535, Sicily was conquered. By the year 536, Belisarius had already conquered Naples and was making his way through the peninsula. Rome itself was conquered when forces from the Eastern Roman Empire marched through the Porta Asinaria and entered the city that had previously served as the imperial capital. However, the conflict was not even close to being done. The ongoing military operations in the northern region of Italy were characterized by enormous amounts of slaughter, notably the sacking of Mediolanum, modern-day Milan. Eventually, in the year 540, Belisarius marched his army into the capital of the Ostrogothic people, which was located in Ravenna. This occurred just a short time before Justinian called him back to Constantinople. In response to the increased Sassanid pressures in the east, Belisarius had been called back into service. Khosrow had violated the rules of the perpetual peace and invaded Roman territory in the year 540. He was responsible for the destruction of significant cities like Antioch, as well as the collection of tribute. Similarly, the Ostrogoths, commanded by Totila beginning in 541, rose up against the authority of the Eastern Romans, defeated them at Faenza in 542, and retook a significant portion of the territory in the southern region of Italy while they were still busy in the east. Because he lacked the necessary soldiers, Belisarius was unable to successfully regain Eastern Roman supremacy after being transported back to the west. During the course of this war, Rome was captured and held by opposing forces on multiple occasions. 
It wasn't until Justinian sent a sizable army under the direction of Narses that the Romans were able to defeat the Ostrogoths, first at the Battle of Busta Galorum and then at Mons Lactarius in 552. Both of these victories came in the year 552. The defeat of the Franks in the Battle of Casalinum in 554 put an end to the threat they posed. Italy was brought back under Roman authority, although the Eastern Roman hold on the peninsula never amounted to much more than a precarious position at best. Generals and Jealousy, Emperor Justinian and Belisarius. It is impossible to tell the tale of Justinian's attempts to regain Roman rule over former regions without mentioning the impact that Belisarius had on those attempts. It is common knowledge that he embodied the traditional Roman virtues, and he was named one of the last Romans on a lengthy list that also included figures such as Brutus, who was responsible for the assassination of Julius Caesar, and Stilicho, who was a Roman Vandal general in the early 5th century. His military career was successful, despite the fact that it was frequently waged against the odds. He had been an instrumental figure in putting an end to the civil turmoil that was taking place during the Nika riots. Then conducting military operations on behalf of the emperor in both the east and the west, with the goal of regaining Roman sovereignty over large swaths of territory that had been abandoned by the Romans for some time, including the cities of Carthage and Rome. In the year 540, the Ostrogoths extended an invitation to Belisarius to sit atop the Western Empire throne. He pretended to accept Justinian's authority, but when he conquered the city of Ravenna, he did so in Justinian's name. Despite this, the foundation for distrust has already been laid. In the year 562, as Belisarius was nearing the end of his life, he was put on trial in Constantinople on charges of plotting against the emperor. In spite of being found guilty and sentenced to prison, the imperial pardon that got him out of jail so quickly was a reflection of the stormy relationship that existed between the two men. In addition to this, a story developed out of it that became very well known during the Middle Ages. According to this, Belisarius had been blinded on the instructions of Justinian, and he had been relegated to the position of a miserable beggar who had been left to implore the benevolence of strangers from the streets of Rome. The vast majority of contemporary academics believe that this is a work of fiction, despite the fact that it is a story that has inspired creative works throughout history. The brutality of Justinian, along with the humiliation of Belisarius, presented an easy and pliable historical topic for portraying the brutality of kings. A match made in heaven, Justinian and Theodora. It is not often that saints are condemned for their promiscuity or venal charms, as Edward Gibbon wrote of her, but Empress Theodora, Justinian's wife, was no average lady. She was a very powerful and influential figure in the Roman Empire. Her beginnings were simple, as she was born to parents who were rumored to have worked in the entertainment industry. According to legend, her father, Acacius, was a bear trainer in the Hippodrome, while her mother was a dancer and actress. In the beginning, a law prevented Justinian from marrying Theodora, but Justin stepped in to help out his nephew in this matter. It is possible that it would have spared his life. In the face of the Nika riots, it is said that Theodora fortified her husband by telling him that the royal purple is the noblest shroud. This was done in order to shame him into abandoning his plans to flee. She was essentially implying that it was more honorable to perish while serving as an emperor as opposed to escaping and continuing to live a life of obscurity. In Justinian's legal code, novel 8.1, she is referred to as the partner in my deliberations because of her prominence at the imperial court. The magnificent mosaics at the Basilica of San Vitale in Ravenna, which depict the empress glaring down on worshippers and illustrating her prominence in the empire, are an excellent example of this. The competing narratives of Theodora's life present significant challenges when attempting to understand the real Theodora. Even Procopius, the most prolific historian who lived during the reign of Justinian, presents various pictures of the empress that are radically different from one another. The negative portrayal of Theodora that can be found in his book, Secret History, in which she is portrayed as having a passion for political intrigue and engaging in sexual activity with multiple men is the one that has endured the longest. It would appear, however, 
that Theodora was a devout Christian who championed the cause of her Miaphysite faith, which was in direct opposition to the ideas held by her husband, who was a Chalcedonian. As a direct result of this, she was accused of encouraging heresy and division throughout the empire. Despite this, she never wavered in her commitment to her beliefs. This appears to have become more obvious following her passing in the year 548, most likely due to cancer. Then, the efforts that Justinian made to bring the Miaphysites and the Chalcedonians together in a harmonious manner were attributed to his regard for the memory of his cherished wife. She was also canonized, so becoming a saint in the Eastern as well as the Oriental Orthodox churches, just like her husband was. Abandoned by God? The Plague of Justinian and Other Disasters In the last decades of Justinian's reign, grand plans for the reconquest and grandeur of the empire were derailed by unexpected events. Beginning in the year 530 and continuing forth, the empire was beset by a string of catastrophes that, taken together, must have given the impression that God had forsaken the realm. In the beginning, the 530s were plagued by darkness and starvation. Due to a volcanic eruption, possibly in Iceland, poisonous gases were released into the atmosphere, depriving farmers in the Mediterranean and near east of the sunlight their crops required to thrive. Soon after, famine wreaked havoc on the empire and its surrounding territories. Plague broke out in Justinian's empire less than a decade later in 542 and quickly spread over the land. This is now understood to have been an outbreak of bubonic plague, similar to the disease that ravaged Europe and Asia in the Middle Ages. Countless people across the empire perished as a result of the pandemic. Justinian himself fell ill with the sickness, but he managed to beat it by some miracle. The Sasanian Empire was another one of the lands that was devastated by this plague. In the past, the Roman Empire was afflicted by various outbreaks of plague, the most notable of which was the Antonine Plague, which wreaked havoc on the empire during the so-called Golden Age of the empire, which occurred under the reign of Marcus Aurelius. In an account that resembles Thucydides' narration of the plague of Athens in the 5th century BC, the historian Procopius claims that the disease was first recognized at Pelusium, which was a port in Roman-controlled Egypt. Thucydides' tale takes place in the 5th century BC. It quickly became widespread after that. Inadvertently contributing to the spread of the potentially fatal disease were grain ships coming from Egypt to Constantinople to feed the city's expanding population. Although Justinian and the empire made a full recovery, they were unable to escape the vagaries of the natural world. After another decade in 551, the Mediterranean basin was shaken by the earthquake that occurred at Beirut. The earthquakes were felt all the way from Alexandria to Antioch, which is along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. The subsequent tsunami was responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands. Empire Builder Justinian and Constantinople For Emperor Justinian to be viewed in the same regard as the greatest Roman emperors of antiquity, he needed an imperial capital that was on par with their achievements. The city of Constantinople, in particular, saw a great deal of construction activity throughout his reign, which was frequently magnificent in nature. The Hagia Sophia, also known as the Church of the Holy Wisdom, was constructed between the years 532 and 537 and is considered to be the most well-known of all of his monuments. The previous iteration of this church, which was built in a Western style, that is, a basilica style, had been dedicated in the year 360 AD by Constantius II, who succeeded Constantine the Great. However, this building had been destroyed by the Nica riots, providing Justinian with the opportunity to leave a mark on the city that would be remembered for a long time. Isidore of Miletus and Anthemius of Tralles were in charge of supervising the construction of the architectural wonder. When Justinian entered the enormous dome-covered interior of the church for the first time, legend has it that he cried, Solomon, I have outdone thee, immediately afterward. Prior to the completion of Seville Cathedral in 1520, it had the title of being the largest cathedral for about a thousand years. The rebuilding of Hagia Sophia was not the only building project undertaken by the emperor during his reign. In addition, he oversaw the construction of the Church of the Holy Apostles, as well as the Church of St. Sergius and Bacchus, which was eventually designated as the Little Hagia Sophia. 
Both of these churches were constructed in the 530s at the request of Justinian and Theodora. The first of these is thought to have been the burial place of a number of emperors, including a pair of greats, Constantine and Theodosius, while the second of these was dedicated to the popular cult of a pair of Roman soldiers, Sergius and Bacchus, who were martyred for their Christian beliefs during the persecutions of Diocletian in the year 303. The construction work undertaken by Justinian was not restricted to the construction of religious buildings. In the magnificent Roman imperial tradition, he also glorified himself by using the urban spaces of the imperial capital. This was done in the city of Constantinople. In particular, he is known for building the magnificent column of Justinian in the Augustium, which is the most important ceremonial square in the city. It commemorated the emperor's successes in the east and was crowned by an impressive statue of him riding an equestrian mount. A Secret History Justinian and Procopius. Procopius of Caesarea, who was the most important Greek language historian of the 6th century and wrote throughout that time period, is the primary source for information regarding the life and times of Emperor Justinian. He wrote the secret history, history of the wars, and buildings during the time that Justinian was in power. All three of these histories cover the same time period. In the year 527, he was given the position of Aedeser for Belisarius, which thrust him into the power structures of the imperial government. He went on campaign with the great general in both the East and the West, and their destinies were inextricably linked because of this. Procopius's fate was inextricably linked with that of the great general. Additionally, Procopius was a witness to the terrible upheaval and massive amount of bloodshed that occurred during the Nica riots. It is quite possible that Procopius also held a seat in the Senate of Constantinople, which would have elevated his status as a significant and influential figure in the city. The History of the Wars, which covers in its eight books the wars in the East, the conquest of Vandal North Africa, and the Gothic Wars that Belisarius waged in Italy, is still considered by historians to be the most important historical narrative written by Procopius. His buildings is essentially a panegyric that extols Emperor Justinian for the various public architectural projects that he oversaw and oversaw completion of around the empire. Throughout the entire text, Justinian is portrayed as a model of a Christian emperor by virtue of his construction of churches and his administration of policies that benefited the general populace of the empire. The picture of the emperor and the imperial court that is presented in The Secret History, the book for which Procopius is best known, stands in stark contrast to the view that is presented here. Procopius uses this passage to skewer Justinian, Theodora, Belisarius, and Antonina, who was married to Belisarius. Belisarius, who Procopius had served under, is a weak cuckold who is frequently willfully oblivious of his wife's infidelity. The emperor is so nasty that he borders on being demonic. Theodora is the personification of unbridled lust and cold calculation. It is not quite clear what prompted Procopius to make such a dramatic about face, but some people believe that he had a fallback strategy in mind. If Justinian were to be deposed, then Procopius may be able to maintain his own position by ingratiating himself with the new rulers if he published a text that was critical of Justinian. This theory has been put out by some people. Regardless of the circumstances, the works of Procopius have shown to have enduring appeal, serving as a source of motivation for later authors such as Robert Graves, who wrote Count Belisarius in 1938. However, not one single living person in the entirety of the Roman world had the good fortune to escape from this man. This was the judgment that Procopius came to regarding Justinian. Even if he is not remembered as the most beloved historical character, there is no debate about the fact that Emperor Justinian was a towering figure in the Eastern Roman Empire in the 6th century, and that his legacy, which includes law codes, architecture, and other things, is still felt today. Even though hopes of a Renovatio Imperi were yet in the far-off future, Rome had already been recovered, at least for the time being. We hope you like this video, subscribe to the channel if you're a history addict, and please let us know about what civilization or time period we should talk about. Also, watch another video here.